Oh, dear mama, this documentary, uh, if you thought you knew Tupac and if you thought you understood the Black Panther movement, you need to watch this. Uh, it's, of course, on my what to watch list. And joining me is one of the executive producers of Dear Mama, which I, I finished and it's amazing. Uh, he's also a legend. So and I can't believe this is the first time he's on. But, you know, it's my oversight because this man has uh, been on a journey in many ways parallel, but then so much more ascended in this in this space with the books and the documentaries and all of the uh, ways in which he's moving the needle. Emmy Award winning the Chris Rock show on HBO, Hip Hop Honors and uh, the pro- executive producer of American Gangster, the crime series as well. Let me welcome the great Nelson George. Hey, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You know, thank you. Thank you. I mean, we're we're celebrating 50 years of hip hop this year. And yeah. um, you know, and I think about your career, my career, Kevin Powell, Daniel Smith, you know, there's like the Source magazine and all of the ways in which our culture um has shifted and changed the entire world. And the writers, this is where we, you know, cut our cut our teeth, right? We we cut our teeth on this thing. Well, you know, hip hop uh, is a foundational art form because unlike unlike jazz and R&B and soul music and even funk that came before it, it had an ability to expand outside of music so that I can tell you my career uh, has been directly influenced my post writing career, you know, um, from uh, doing CB4 with Chris Rock in 93, a comedy about hip hop. I did a film uh, uh, with Queen Latifah called Life Support for HBO. It was essentially about HIV, but the fact is that I knew Queen Latifah and her manager, Shaquem, from the hip hop world, and that helped me make that film happen. Um, The Get Down uh, Mm. series on Netflix that I was a producer and writer on, they hired me because I'd been there and they wanted someone who had that long history. So I can go on and on uh, throughout my sort of post writing career to where hip hop, um, the, the expansion, the expansive quality of hip hop and the fact that it created so many stars and the fact that it created so much uh, culture that it's not just music, but fashion, dance, slang, so forth. Um, made it possible for me to expand outside of just being a a journalist. Yeah. What I liked about this particular film, unlike some of the others, which to me, you know, we, we watch hip hop people go to stardom, you know, have record labels, clothing lines and all this. But when I watched Dear Mama, Tupac's commitment to us, to our liberation, to, you know, honoring a very complicated relationship with his own mother, which so many people have anyway, mothers who aren't Black Panthers, who aren't addicted, you know, um, and how he in his teens and early 20s had a sense of self and maturity that to this day, there's a scene where he's talking about girls and how, you know, women, you know, he's approaching them and hi, how are you? You look nice. You're beautiful. And he's not getting any reaction and he's watching the other guys. And I'm, I was thinking about which came first, the chicken or the egg, you know, like how we now to this day socialize as men and women, black men and women in particular. I, I go back to what Tupac and it was like, how many brothers who were on that path turned into dogs because of the reaction that they got or you know, like what, do you remember this scene? I know you oh, do. very well. He's 17 years old. Uh, he's being interviewed as part of a program with interviewing a lot of students at the at that high school uh, in Marin, uh, in Marin, a very rich high school, by the way. And uh, he's talking about the fact that he can't get any love for any women because they he's not masculine enough. Uh, and that's something that any bookish, I went through that as well, any bookish guy goes through where you're kind of taught by your mother to be respectful, but there's a certain kind of swagger, a certain kind of attitude that women are drawn to. And, you know, people blame guys, but a lot of, a lot of that is their reaction to their environment. Uh, there's a lot to be said about that, I'm sure, on the women's side, but certainly there's a certain kind of sense of feeling safe or protected that sometimes women must feel from these other guys. And so Pac, you know, went through a transition and it's, you know, it's really great is that we were able to interview two different of his best friends from high school 
who both talk about that transition in great detail and how he evolved. Um, I think the thing about Tupac that's worth, uh, that's important to note is that, that to say you know Tupac is to say you know a chameleon. You say you know an actor. There's various parts of his life where he, he transformed. And he did this many, many times between 15 and 25. Um, I, I, I think I met Tupac about four times in my life. And I would say every time I met him, he was a different person because I met him at different points of his journey. The guy I met the first time was at some music conference uh, when he's probably just very young. He's got glasses on and uh, I'm on some panel and he introduced himself. He's very polite and very kind of, you know, because he was a, he was a, you know, some of he was a musical, you know, he was a Shakespearean musical comedy kid who, who read poetry and read Shakespeare and stuff. Uh, and then I encountered him again and he was on his way to being a star. And he was totally like, you know, energized and, and draped in gold. Uh, and that trend around the time of uh, poetic justice. And then the last time I saw him was in the last year of his life um, at a post party, MTV party in New York. And he was completely, he was that crazy, uh, energized and somewhat dangerous dude. And that's only within, you know, what is that? That's four years, maybe. Uh, I think most people see Tupac, uh, you know, a lot of the general public see him as the last 18 months of his life. Mm -hmm. I found something interesting. I just want to read you real quick. Uh, I found his, his obituary in the New York Times. And the headline of the obituary in New York Times was rap artist who personified violence. Okay. That was the headline? That was the headline of his obituary in the New York Times. So, so much about him. And I think what, people, what the challenge and what the real success of Dear Mama is, is that that 18 months is not, not the totality of what we're, in fact, it's, it's only a part of his journey. Um, one reason I got involved, I've known Alan Hughes, uh, wow. I've known Alan Hughes since 1990. Look at him, Look at him squinting, trying Ooh. to go back. He was, uh, to go back. <laughs> he was in college, and uh, I, I, I'll never forget it. Um, Tamara Davis, who did a lot of early music videos, in fact, she directed CB4, said she, her brother he was going to school with these two twin brothers. And uh, she sent me a couple of their student films. And I got to tell you, I mean, I've seen a lot of, like, student films. You could see from how they shot it, where how they used the sound design, that these guys were at a next level. And this is like they're you know, 18, 19. Um, and we became friends. And it's funny, it's the first time we worked together. But uh, Alan has a really great perspective because his mother was an activist. His mother was, uh, had been very active in now actually in the women's liberation movement in, uh, of the 70s, 80s. Um, and so when we started working on it, we knew, we learned that the mother was the story. And quite honestly, for me, um, she's way more interesting than Tupac. Oh my goodness. And that comes through. Um, and you're talking about the Hughes brothers, Alan in particular, Alan and Albert, Dead Presidents, Minister mm -hmm. Society, Book of Eli, which is my favorite. You, you, His auntie, his mother, you know, um, somebody asked, well, I asked this question, what would Tupac have been had he lived? Right. Had he lived? He was 25. And just yeah. put that in perspective. He was 25 when he was taken. And yeah. as you mentioned, you saw three versions of him himself. <laughs> he was he had morphed into three different yeah. people by the age of 25. Imagine him today. I think if he's alive today, Jay-Z's Jay-Z's not huge. Mm, well, I mean, there's I, no room. There's no room. Jay -Z. It, 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 Will Smith might not be a movie star. Will Smith might not be uh, married to Jada Pinkett. Well, that, that's interesting. But it definitely, I put it this way, I don't, I don't want to go there, but Tupac's a movie star. Yes, he and, is. And uh, if he'd been able to get through that patch and get away from death row and go into the next evolution, he had um, screenplays he'd written. He wanted to own a, open a restaurant. That was one of the things that, that came up in our research. And we saw like the, he'd written out a whole menu. Um, so he would have evolved as many people in hip hop have evolved, he would have evolved. He still would have made records probably into his thirties, 
and maybe, but I'm sure the boy would have, I mean, he would have written books. He was a natural prose writer. Uh, he would have expanded and that was really his goal. So uh, one of the funny things about this process is, you know, uh, I'm in my sixties now, Alan's in his fifties. And we're looking back now on an era when we were young men and we see how far we've evolved from that time, from 96. And imagine how many evolutions this brother would have went through if he's alive. Mm. 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 I think about that, um, Nelson George, quite frequently. I uh, I don't uh, ever want to go back to being in my 20s. Um, oh. so, so much, <laughs> so much better uh, at this age. Uh, but, you know, it's you better have later. Through. It is. It is. And people don't even appreciate, you know, that everyone's trying to be younger. No, this is a great time to be because you know so much. That, what did Bevy Smith say? You get, it, gets, it gets later, greater. It gets greater, later. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And Bevy, <laughs> Bevy is, is the diva, the queen uh, on Sirius XM. I love her. Uh, that said, for you, having watched all of this, having watched so much destruction, of and decimation the east coast west coast uh fabricated beef that cost the lives of so many all of the incarceration all of the vilification do you reading that headline in the new york times mm -hmm. demonizing a whole group of people and as tupac would say we don't have planes we're not bringing the drugs in you know we're not we don't have gas we don't have um uh what do you say bulletproof vests the police are coming in we don't have tasers we don't have any of the things to protect ourselves y'all coming in you got backup we don't have backup and you want to demonize us he was on the precipice. And I feel like in many ways, the Fred Hampton, you know, that that comparison, I don't know. I don't know if there was some funny stuff going on with him not being here because he was also poking his finger in the eye of of oppression. Well, you know, one thing I would say when you, you bring up the, his ability to to articulate and debate. Go back. Uh, I don't which episode we go into it, but there's a whole episode. I think it's maybe episode two or three where. Um, we talk about how Feeney would punish him by making him read the New York Times. And then punish him further by making him debate or have to argue a point. And so when you see this guy at 17, at 19, at 21, uh, she had trained him to think um, in an analytical way, trained him to think in a way where he could articulate and, and counter bogus arguments. Um, and all of that is layered in with the knowledge of being around the Panthers. And, and that, so you have a guy, one of the only people of the hip hop generation, quite honestly, who was, because he was steeped in the Panthers, is steeped in the ideas of, of, and also he wasn't, his mother is very articulate and very clear. She's not a black nationalist. She is a oppressed, she's a champion of oppression. She, she doesn't care about, that's why she named him Tupac Shakur. So I think there's also, I think there's a misnomer that people think that Pac and his, and his mother and the Black Panthers were like black, 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 black. No, they were anti-capitalists. They were Marxists. And I think the biggest, one of the biggest, there's two achievements of the film that I'm very proud of. One is that we're defining the Panthers in a way that's much more nuanced than I think a lot of people understand them. And two, people think about the Panthers, they think about the Oakland Panthers. They think about Bobby Seale and Eldridge and Huey Newton. There were many, many chapter of the Panthers. The Chicago chapter was Fred Hampton. The New York chapter was very specific. They were also much more cultural nationalists. Now, what that means is that they were much more Afrocentric in their thinking than, let's say, the Oakland Panthers, and, that, and that's an important story point, especially in episode three. So what, would, what, what I think we achieve in the, in the film is not just simply a biography of Tupac or even a biography of Afeni. We're also you know, using Tupac and to, give, to, to put Black radical thought and Black radical ideology in the minds of 21st century people in a way that they, they never would have gone if it was just a Black Panther doc. So I'm really happy about that. Yeah, you, you delivered that um, for sure. We're talking with Nelson George, the great, the great Nelson George. Um, I don't even want to limit you to author and, you know, producer and all of that. You just, um, you're a generation's um, propeller on so many levels. 
Uh, you did one of your first books was on Michael Jackson, and you have I another it Michael. Jackson. Book, actually, it was your very first book. Okay, yeah. now you have another Michael Jackson project coming out. Yeah, I, um, uh, the estate uh, had me do a. Uh, I did a 40th anniversary uh, documentary on the making of Thriller. That'll be out at, toward the end of the year. Okay. I, I want to play this Michael Jackson clip that I've been holding on to. I was going to play it yesterday and I didn't have time because um, I feel some ways about the estate right now. So, I, you know, maybe you can talk about it, maybe not. Uh, unfortunately, Piers Morgan is in this clip. So y'all oh, just can't ignore, you know, sometimes you got to chew up the meat to spit out the bones to get to the goodness. Okay. So we're going to say that there's trash in this clip. Piers okay. Morgan is in it. But right. what is being said is is so pertinent to where we are today. Can you play it, Smith? About a plan to buy Marvel, the comic business, back in 2001 or two, I think it was. Let's listen to this. We easily go into Universal and buy, we would own Jaws, E.T., Love's Encounters, you know, all the classics from, uh, from uh, Universal, own all that stuff that would allow us to do a Universal, I mean, a channel, part of the Marvel channel, you know, not only the Marvel characters, but Marvel films like the catalog. We could do anything we want from restaurants to, to retail, theme park. Now, you actually got the financing in place, I believe, for this deal. Then came the, the scandal yeah. court cases, and it all got put on the back burner. Disney ended up buying Marvel and doing exactly what Michael had predicted and making a fortune at it. Hmm. From the Beatles catalog to this to purchasing sony one would argue nelson george that uh when folk dream big and then have the means to execute sometimes they end up not being here anymore well i mean michael jackson from what i've seen in, in, in all the conversations i've had was a big visionary thinker um he thought globally he thought was great forethought thought in terms of, because he was a, someone who understood pop culture. Um, and when you watch his videos, uh, you see the ability to synthesize various traditions. One of the things that's really gonna be interesting about the doc is that we went into great detail about his dancing and his performance style. And I think that when you look at literally what he did from moment to moment on the Motown 25, when you look at the references in the Thriller video, when you look at the references in Beat It, he's taking from street dance, he's taking from contemporary modern dance. Uh, he takes, he can unite um, Fred Astaire and Crazy Legs. Uh, and so he had a big vision. I think one of the things that that really, you know, that I saw in, the, in his, because we use a lot of his writings in the film, not quite as extensively as in the Tupac thing, but Michael also kept uh, affirmations that he wrote almost on a daily basis. And his, and this is something actually quite honestly that I didn't know and I feel like that um, I wish I had known when I was younger, because I think I would have written about him differently, uh, is, is his connection to blackness and black identity uh, and how much that motivated him uh, that the idea of world, even though he was a globalist in the best sense of the word, he had a very strong sense, uh, and, he, and he knew the history of, of Black oppression. He knew the history of Black exploitation in the music and entertainment business. Uh, he was a much more um, complex than I think that, uh, and like almost every public figure, I think almost every public figure is more complex than they're given because people tend to to decide that these, these five crates are what they are. And that's never mm. who anybody is. Uh, I'm thinking some people we put, give more texture than they actually have as well. Two things could be true. That said, as Michael Jackson, when he says we, I know he's talking about us. And yeah. I think people don't, don't explore the fact that Jermaine who's in the nation of Islam. Like they, they are, you know, I did Janet's book. She picked mm. me over all of the people she could have picked. It was intentional. You know, yeah. like they, the whole family, they understand what this is. And um, I feel like the fact that he's not here is on purpose. But Nelson George, when when the Michael Jackson doc comes back out, where anytime you can just come on back, sir. I don't even know why it took so long. 
Well, actually, I just want to mention one more thing since we're yes. on. Uh, I, among my other projects, uh, I executive produced a project called Flower with Misty Copeland. It's going to premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, it's a half hour, at, uh, I would say, dance advocacy project. We use contemporary dance, the kind of stuff that Misty does. We use street dance. We use uh, Turfin, which is a Bay Area dance style, to talk about homelessness. So we shot in Oakland uh, during the pandemic. It shot on the streets of Oakland. Uh, and it's a very special project trying to use the, the tools of dance to shine a light on a, a global, and especially a national problem of homelessness. So Flower, it premieres June 8th at the at Tribeca Film Festival. It, it's gonna play multiple times there. We'd love for people to try and, and check it out.